I like the subscription model for this company mixed with the hardware and the product revenue mix. I think that's really important. I really like the orange color scheme, so they sold me on that. And yep, I'm happy to be nibbling. You really need to understand the business that you're buying and also the industry and different industry dynamics going on as well. This is very important and I think this is perhaps where Buffett and company went wrong. Welcome back, everyone. Happy Friday. We hope you had a great week. We're happy it's Friday at Chipstock Investor. Nick has his Flamingo shirt to celebrate Flamingo Friday. And we're going to talk about a couple of companies today. First of all, Pure Storage, which we have covered. And you can go back and watch that video for our initial analysis. But we'll do some updates here. And then we're going to poke a little bit of fun at Warren Buffett's tech stock pick. So hope you enjoy this episode. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel. We're still trying to reach our goal of 10,000 subs by the end of this year. We would really appreciate it if you share our channel with your fellow investors and subscribe. Thanks. We'll get right to it. Nick, what do you want to start with first? Let's maybe first talk about HP, ticker symbol HPQ. Uh, because it was just revealed this week that Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway sold a few million shares of that company. And so now that means it's been less than two years since the initial purchase in the first quarter of 2022. And we have yet another tech stock that besides Apple and besides the, the very, very itty bitty, tiny little position in Amazon that Berkshire still has, it makes another tech stock that Warren Buffett and Berkshire is quickly exiting from. The big one, of course, was the very short three to six month round trip in Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing, but now HP. And so Warren Buffett made the wrong HP stock pick because there's two HPs, right? Yeah, we have the traditional HP that everyone thinks about. And then there's HP Enterprise, HPE. Yes. So HPQ. HP, that's the one everyone thinks about because they make PCs and printers, primarily PCs and printers. There's some software stuff there too, but here's basically what happened and where we think Berkshire went wrong. So when they made the purchase back in the first quarter of 2022, HP had a little over a 2% dividend yield, but the company was repurchasing billions and billions of dollars worth of stock. Now, remember, this was still the very, very big explosion in consumer electronics purchasing during the pandemic. And I think maybe Berkshire and company got misled a little bit into thinking that this was going to be the new normal. There was going to be a new long-term trend in PC and printer purchases for households and for businesses. And he bought exactly the tail end of that peak. And it's been all downhill since then. Yeah. Up until this point, Nick, HPE has been a much better bet. They have generated a 14% return versus a negative total return of 19% for HPQ. Yeah. That, that's in a year and nine months. That is a ridiculous divergence. What in the world happened? So PC and printer sales are down. What's up with HP Enterprise? Why is it outperforming by such a wide margin? The answer to all questions at this point in the investor world is AI. And that's the reason that HP Enterprise has been doing so well. As you said, Nick, not everybody is going out buying PCs and printers anymore, but one thing they are doing is upgrading their data centers. And that's where HP Enterprise comes in. HP Enterprise, on the other hand, has had this tremendous wave of demand for things like AI servers. Now, Casey, I want to talk briefly here because I think there's a big subset of investors that, that try to follow the Buffett rule and just try to pick cheap stocks that pay a dividend. Y your due diligence can't stop there. You really need to understand the business that you're buying 
And also the industry and different industry dynamics going on as well. This is very important. And I think this is perhaps where Buffett and company went wrong because this is not a new trend. Everybody has known for a long time that follows this industry that PCs and smartphones and consumer electronics are going to essentially flatline going forward. The amount of industry growth is going to, generally speaking, follow the trend of inflation over the long term. Now, you can see that here in the ticker terminal for HPQ, the revenue growth expectation for HPQ over time, very low single digit expectation, even after this massive decline falling off the cliff from the pandemic era demand, still just very anemic growth. Meanwhile, HP Enterprise, we've talked about this in numerous videos like the Broadcom one and their focus on enterprise markets versus consumer markets. And you get nice, steady, consistent demand, at least relatively speaking, consistent demand from the enterprise market. And in addition to that, like you already said, Casey, the data center market expected to be in very high growth mode for the duration of this decade as new data centers get built and existing ones get retrofitted with more advanced gear. And this is a refresh cycle. So every four to five years, these companies tend to refresh their data center servers with new ones with the latest and greatest, most powerful chips. So along the way, Casey, I think maybe if you missed the last video on our software stocks, we did talk about chips. You made a nice pizza infographic that sort of illustrates this dynamic as to why HPQ was the wrong pick and HPE, we think probably will end up being the better long-term pick. Up to this point, it's been the better pick, but we think it will continue to be so going forward. I'll show you my slide that I made on the pizza just because I'm very proud of it. The current chip market on the left, $550 billion per year. Currently, the PC and smartphone make up about one-third of the market. But Push that out to 2030, and that same segment, PC and smartphone, will make up just one quarter of the pizza, and data center and AI making up a greater amount, up to one third. I should also mention that by 2030, the chip market is going to be about 80 to 90 percent bigger than it is right now. So you can see the dramatic increase in shift to AI and data center becoming such a huge portion of the industry. Right. Yeah. Casey, it's the pizza is getting bigger and the slice of it getting bigger for the data center server and AI bit. I wanted to ask you this week, Casey, did you see the Oracle conference call or did you read the conference call transcript? No, I sure didn't, but you can tell me about it. I can tell you're super excited about this, but I've been writing a bit about Larry Ellison, and actually giving Oracle some attention since this time last year, because they were the first mover on those latest and greatest NVIDIA AI powered servers. But this was an interesting little quote that I think is in keeping with our discussion on Warren Buffett. So this is what Mr. Ellison said on the earnings call, notable cloud critic in the past. But he's on board, and so is someone else with cloud computing. He said, I'm now also able to announce that all nine utility companies owned by Berkshire Hathaway, this is the Berkshire Hathaway Energy Unit, are in process of replacing all their existing ERP systems or Enterprise Resource Planning Systems and standardizing on Oracle's Fusion Cloud applications. Okay. What does that mean? I I thought it was a nice divergence from the AI buzzword to Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Anyways, that's not really what it means. I think what it does mean is everyone's talking about AI servers, all this massive amount of growth expected from NVIDIA and everyone trying to catch up in the semiconductor world. And everyone's forgotten that just plain old vanilla cloud computing is actually very much still a growth market, which is why we highlighted the software stocks in the video earlier this week. And I wanted to bring it up again here because 
amazingly, this is still the foundation of all this generative AI work that we're talking about now. And cloud computing is still expected to be a double digit percentage growth market through the 2030s. If Berkshire Hathaway is finally getting on board with adopting more cloud compute, yes, it is probably indicative that the market has matured, but it also illustrates the fact that there are still just a lot of businesses out there in the US and especially in other parts of the world that have not even touched this yet. That's amazing to me. The potential is still incredible. Okay, everyone, I had to take a quick break. I realized my shirt was wrinkled, so I went and changed it so I don't offend anyone. Sorry, my bad. Anyway, we're back. Nick, should we be buying HP Enterprises or are there better companies out there? So I know a lot of people's pick in the server market and especially the AI server market is super micro computer SMCI. Generally speaking, though, Casey, I, all of these companies that buy chips and assemble them into a server and then sell them, we view them as like basically auto manufacturers and businesses like this just don't meet our personal investment criteria. So to each their own, but no, I don't think we're buying HP Enterprise stock. Certainly not going to be buying HP, HPQ, and it looks like maybe Buffett maybe doesn't want nearly as much of it as before either. <laughs> Pure Storage, we'll just do a quick refresher on what this company does. Pure Storage is data storage as a service. They have a subscription model. They can provide the hardware that's housed in a remote data center, which is accessed via the internet, or you can purchase the hardware itself from them for your on-premises data. Some of the competitors for Pure Storage are HP Enterprise, NetApp, Dell Technologies, which sell servers or components of a server. And the key difference here, Casey, is Pure Storage focuses just on those data storage arrays, specifically all flash arrays. We'll get to that in just a quick second. But yeah, a focus on just the storage arrays, which you can think of as the equivalent of the compute server. So if the server is the computing unit for the, the compute part of a data center, you have switches and routers. Those are the devices in the networking piece of a data center. And then you have these storage arrays. That's where all the data gets housed for either long-term backup or at rest until needed for an application that's in operation or in development of an application, something to that effect. For HP Enterprise, storage revenue was $1.1 billion, down 5% year over year. And then we have Dell Technologies. This is another competitor. Its storage was $4.19 billion, which was down 3% year over year. NetApp Q1 revenue was $1.43 billion, which is down 10% year over year. Now let's compare that to... Pure storage, our subject for today. Product revenue was 400 million down from 415 million last year, about 3.6% in decrease. So, the, the takeaway here, as we've been talking about for over a year now, pretty nasty downturn for the memory market. A lot of this is driven by oversupply of memory chips. And then also a general slowdown in uh, big business spending this year as global economic growth comes to a screeching halt in many ways in 2023 after the pandemic rebound. But we introduced this with the cloud because overall cloud growth will remain quite strong. A lot of companies still migrating to the cloud, which means over the course of the next decade, a lot more storage will be needed. But Casey, so you mentioned just pure storage product, which declined basically in line with competitors, but overall revenue actually was quite good. There's another component to pure storage's story that has drawn us to the business. I think I, I roasted you a little bit last time we talked about pure storage because they have a subscription service, which I know you usually dislike very much, but Pure Storage's subscription 
services revenue was actually two hundred and eighty nine million two hundred and thirty two million last year, which is a twenty four percent increase year over year. And so the overall revenue was six hundred and eighty nine million compared to six forty seven year over year, a six percent increase. So Casey, I, I have no problem with subscription services if it makes sense for the business model and for what customers need. And peer storage, I, I do like it because they offer their customers both. They can buy the hardware, they can buy the product and manage it themselves. Or peer storage has this fully ready to go out of the box subscription service, which also includes hardware upgrades over time. But the point is where a lot of the competitors are still in decline in the storage market, peer storage's overall revenue continues to increase in a down market. And that's really powerful. So before we proceed and talk about the financials and the valuation real quick, Casey, what is an all flash array? Because peer storage talks about this a lot as being one of their key differentiators from everyone else. An all-flash array is different than the traditional older hard disk drive. The hard disk drive is the one where there's like a, an actual spinning disk inside the storage unit versus the all-flash array, which is just an actual chip that stores the data. And this is significant because these all flash arrays are much more durable, they're faster processing times, and and they're a lot smaller. Hopefully these pictures help with visualizing the difference between these two things, the hard disk versus now the flash memory. So uh, up until this point, you would think this is a no-brainer transition, get rid of the hard disks move to flash, move to solid state memory. Uh, but there's been a long lag in making this transition because the key differentiator here is, yes, hard disk drives, the spinning mechanical components, they've actually been able to increase the memory capacity of these over the years by a great deal. But the performance is slow. While compute performance has steadily increased over the decades, hard disk drives performance in actual data transfer has been pitiful, close to almost no increase really as the years go by, but they're cheap. They're super cheap. So if you're a company, you have a data center and you just need mass storage for backup somewhere, you probably don't care that much about performance. So you just keep buying these old hard disk drives. NAND flash by comparison is quite expensive, but pure storage has developed the system that has steadily decreased the cost of their flash systems. They use software to help optimize it. And we're reaching the point now where for mass storage, the price for flash has finally become equal with hard disk drive based storage arrays. We'll put a link to the description that Pure Storage provides regarding these flash arrays. It's actually a good read and helps you understand the business model further. Yeah, maybe a bit nerdy, but if you're seriously looking at this company, definitely worth digging into it and understanding what they're up to. Now, Casey, I, I do like this about peer storage. I, I find it refreshing because I, I find that oftentimes their presentations are quite balanced in explaining that an all flash array up until this point, probably not the best fit for everybody, but they're working hard to try to get it to that point. But even though they could probably hype this thing a lot, I, I do find the company to be quite balanced in that you don't hear them say anything like, we're trying to be Amazon of the data storage world. To me, the more I look at it, I see a management team that's just trying to build a solid business for the long term. Now, I think everybody knows that we like businesses that are able to combine hardware and software together. Uh, we think that makes for a, a really sticky, very powerful business that gets the competitive edge of having hardware, but with the super scalability of the software side, the subscription. So uh, Casey, maybe show the, the slide here of Pure Storage's uh, profitability 
over time. They have been free cash flow positive for years. Annual free cash flow for this last year at $609 million so far in fiscal year 2023. Now, about the net income, this is flip-flopped a little bit from the last video where we talked about some companies that have positive net income, but negative free cash flow because of the sheer amount of expansion as they buy new property and equipment. A bit of a reverse here because of Pure Storage's subscription service. They've been able to realize positive free cash flow over time because of the growth in the software subscription part of the business. Software subscription steadily increasing as a percentage of overall revenue, but meanwhile, net income negative because of non-cash expenses, things like amortization of intangible assets, stock-based compensation. Of course, you got to pay that, that sales force whenever you're dealing with a software business. It's scalable, but you got to pay people to market it. But again, a steady convergence of these two metrics over time. And where a lot of businesses, I th we think in this particular section of the industry struggle to get really good high profit margins. We think Pure Storage actually has the business model to generate 20% plus profit margins, both on a free cash flow basis and eventually on an operating gap operating basis as well. We like that about this company. Earnings per share are expected to turn very positive next year. Shares currently trade for 24 times analyst expectations for next year's earnings per share and about 18 times next year's expected pre-cash flow. Nick, are we buying pure storage? Yes, this is one we started to nibble on earlier this summer and one that, that we'll continue to nibble on. So we own Micron. It, it's had a pretty nice run on an expected rebound in chip sales at, at some point. It looks like the bottom is in on ship sales, but really it's a just hellacious ride in <laughs> Micron in owning just pure memory chip companies. So we like pure storage. We like the smoother ride. And we think because they do have the product sales segment, they'll also get a nice bump in revenue once this market starts to rebound. And then of course the subscription over time, riding the cloud compute wave. We like this about this business. We think it's at a, a fairly attractive price point right now. So again, we're nibbling. We think it's a better buy than Micron. And so we're very slowly increasing our position size in this company. Yeah. What do you think, Casey? Yeah, I completely agree with you, Nick. I like pure storage. I like the subscription model for this company mixed with the hardware and the product revenue mix. I think that's really important. I really like the orange color scheme. So they sold me on that. And yep, I'm happy to be nibbling on pure storage. Okay, fair enough. I think we should actually end the show on that note right there. Stay tuned for more, everyone. We've got more ship stock news for you, including next week, we'll do a one year review. We actually just hit the one year anniversary for our channel, including nearly the one-year anniversary for the Chipstock Investor Portfolio. We'll review how that did and any adjustments going forward. Stay tuned for that. I think we're very pleased with the way our Chipstock picks have performed in the last year. We'll reveal all of that to you next week. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and we will see you all again soon at Chipstock Investor. Investor.